in terms of just to give. Sorry, Tony. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you... Sorry, I got a message. Sounds kicked out of Zoom for a second, so I'm just making sure I've got it. I'm back in. Okay. Yeah, we'll find Tony. That that scared me a little. Okay, so just to give you some background as to where this this short program came from, it's part of a larger training program developed for some clients who. I'm sure many of you have been through um, traditional investigation training, whether that's top set or taproot or, and I went through the same process. And as a psychologist, the one thing that really struck me was that, where are the people? Where are the people in this, this whole process? Because we're, we're taught to go out and look for the information. We're taught to go out and develop a timeline. And actually in some ways we think about human memory as though it works that way. As though when we remember something, it's like pressing record on a, I say video, but that's an old thing, isn't it? I'll show my age. Um, you're pressing record. And then later on, when you want to know that information, you then come back and just press play again. Unfortunately, human memory doesn't work that way. It's not great. And it's not actually great under the best of circumstances, let alone under the worst of circumstances. So understanding how our brains work, understanding how do we get the, the best out of any form of investigation process. That's what this, this, this is about. And so I just want to give you an example. I'm sitting there saying that our observation and memory are not great at the best of times. Not. How many of you have um, walked away from home, driven down the road, and thought, "Did I lock the front door? <laughs> Did I do that?" How many of you have? Um, well, I've done. I think my favourite example of this was, I had milk in one hand and my mobile phone in the other. Guess which one I put in the refrigerator? <laughs> we do this stuff. Memory is not great. So I want to give you a couple of little fun examples just to get us going. And then we'll get into the bit of the, the, the darker side of memory because we're going to talk about traumatic memories. Now, one thing I would also say is that as soon as I start talking about traumatic memories, I'm aware that some of you may have experienced those memories at any point. If you need to step away, please do. If you want to talk about it afterwards, I'm a therapist. I'm happy to. I just want to get, put that caveat out there because as soon as we start talking about traumatic memories, sometimes that can bring back memories. But let's start with some fun. What I want to do is just demonstrate how good our observation and memory skills are at the best of times. So in this first example, this is a nice short little video. What I'm going to do, show you the video and just I'll pause the video and I want you to see how many things you've noticed that change. There are a few changes in, in this video. What they call in films continuity errors. Some things in the room have changed. Let's see how many you can spot. So when you give up your answers, please pop them in the chat room. And um, this is going to be very confusing. The other Tony, Tony D, is going to actually read them out for me. And we're going to do that when I'm up on the board as well. So let's get going. Just how many things can you see change? Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's skull. Sorry, Tony, we can't actually see the video but on screen. I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Tony, the video's not showing. The video's not showing? No, we can just see your introductory slide. Okay, I will stop and reshare. Try again. We'll I'll... get there in the end. We'll try again. I love technology. I will start it again. You can see it. You can see it. Try again. 
Clearly, somebody in this room. It's just froze. Ridden to death with a blunt instrument. I want. Uh, uh, oh, it's just froze again, Tony. Try and reshare, Tony. That should work, I think, because it was working. Just need to check that you're on mute, actually, now as well. Uh, you just need to check that you've shared the sound, <clears throat> and the video should work. Then yeah. I did that. Yeah. Yep. Try and share your screen again. It was working. Okay, then. Try again. Yep. No problem. I'm going to go into full screen for us. That'd be great. And then just click your play and. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who, at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest Lady Smythe. But, but, but how did you know? Madam, as any horticulturist will tell you, one does not plant petunias until May is out. Take her away. Sorry, madam. It's just a matter of observation. The real question is how observant were you? OK, what did you see change? Hopefully you saw it that time. Everybody's gone really quiet. <laughs> what did you see change? You're on mute, Tony. Oh, yeah, the bear swaps turned into rolling a pin. The rolling Hang on. Pin, yep. Hang on. But they changed the rolling pin for a candlestick. Rolling pin. Yeah. Bear swap for armor. Candlestick for rolling pin. Clock. Yep. yep. Bear to suit armor. Yep. Uh, Brown clock to white clock, coat, yep. clock, armor, eight changes, flowers, detective coat, flowers, clock changed. There wasn't very much left, really, was there? <laughs> 21. <laughs> 21. There 21 changes in that video. What's interesting, if I reshare this, is that actually one of the things that nobody noticed was that this is a completely different person on the floor. <laughs> So, eight changes that someone got, that's not unusual. There are 21 in this video. You're right. The fact that the, so the, the detective coat changed, his hat changed, the person on the floor changed, the clock changed, the rug changed, the, the bear was a, became a suit of armour, the, um, the rolling pin became a candlestick. The lady that walked off, she had a big flower pot, she became a small flower pot, her hat changed. Pretty much everything has changed. One of the things that we're not great at spotting is change. I'll just show you how they filmed this. It's amazing. And action. Clearly, somebody in this room murdered Lord Smythe, who at precisely 3.34 this afternoon, was brutally bludgeoned to death with a blunt instrument. I want each of you to tell me your whereabouts at precisely the time that this dastardly deed took place. I was polishing the brass in the master bedroom. I was buttering his lordship's scones below stairs, sir. Why, I was planting my petunias in the potting shed. Constable, arrest. Lady Smythe. So even when our brains were in a good place, we're in a good con under good conditions, we don't spot everything. Our brains just cannot do it. We have this thing, it's called a perception funnel. We don't take in everything from the world around us. We only take in a small amount. Now, when it comes to actual memory, we have to take it in first and then actually remember it. 
So in this last example, what I'm going to do is give you a just a simple page of random objects. What I'd like you to do is just remember as many of those as you can. Don't write them down. Don't take a picture of the screen. People do all sorts, but <laughs> just have some fun. Um, I just want to see, test your memory. How many of these random items can you remember? Okay, very short period. There's a, very, there's a reason for that short time. I'd like you to count them up in your head and how many you can remember. And I'm gonna do a bit of a street magician's trick and say well, most of you will be saying five right now. Five things. Four, okay, Dawn did well. Anybody beat five? Yeah, Lyndon, take yourself off mute. Give me your, give me your list. I thought I saw a flower, a yep. tricycle, yep. bicycle, um, plane. Um, I asked to see. I did count seven, but I'm now forgetting them. Um, <laughs> They're already starting to disappear. They We're are, yeah. look at why they start to disappear as well. Yeah. So, Under the thank you. The reason it's five because most of our working memory can handle according to a guy called Miller seven plus or minus two things. Oh, uh, Michelle's got mass banana, dog rose, cone, bicycle, and broccoli. Well done. So we're still within that seven plus or minus two. So our working memory at any point can generally handle these things. The trouble is we have very little control over what pops into your head and what takes up one of those elements. Whatever you do, do not think about bananas. How many of you are now thinking about bananas? You can't help it, can you? That's already taking up one of those elements in your head. The point I'm making is that even under the best of conditions, our observation, our memory isn't generally great. So let's start looking at under the worst of conditions because that's what we're interested in, in terms of what happens in terms of an when we're looking at, in terms of an investigation. So what happens to our observation on memory on a bad day? And I did say we're gonna talk about trauma. When, we talk, when I talk about trauma as a psychologist, I'm talking really about anything that, that kicks your brain into what's called fight or flight. We, have, we generally call it fight or flight. It's actually fight, flight, or there's a third one, which is freeze. And wonder, fight, fight, or freeze, free, I can't say that, fight, flight, or freeze, what happens in your brain is incredible. We are beautifully designed to be hunter-gatherers. That's what we're designed to be. So our brains and our body are designed to respond to fight and flight to get us ready to be able to hunt, to be able to run away from a predator or to stand really still. Because if you, if you can't run away and you can't fight, standing really still and you're well camouflaged means the predator is less likely to see you. So that's what we're designed to do. When was the last time you did that in the modern world? Maybe when you stood up to do a presentation, you weren't a confident speaker. You ever seen someone do that? Freeze. So. There's one particular area of our brain that we're in particularly interested in. It's called the hippocampus. It sits right in the inside of the brain. You actually have two called the hippocampi. These switch off during stress. When we're highly stressed, these are absolutely switched off. You probably experience this because the other time that they're switched off is during sleep. You ever woken up? Remember a really interesting dream and it's fascinating. And then five minutes later, you can't remember any of it. That's because of the effect of the hippocampus switching off. This is the part of the brain that takes our short-term memory and helps it convert into long-term memory. We have to go through this conversion process. Any form of trauma, but any time we're under fight or flight, whether that is a serious incident or whether that is just under serious stress, the hippocampus switches off. And that can really affect 
our memory. So we really have to understand what's happening in the brain in order to understand actually how do we get the best out of people to try and get the most amount of information from a brain that's actually not designed to remember this. We are not designed to remember memories that were created during, a, during stress, during trauma. Simply because if you were one of our ancestors and you, were, you had to go out hunter gathering and one day you're hunted, how much of that do you actually want to remember? How much of that detail do you want stuck in your head? What's the likelihood you'd go out tomorrow? So switching that part of the brain off so it didn't store it in long-term memory actually in some ways helped our ancestors. It doesn't help us when we're trying to do an incident investigation. Though. And in terms of my experience of incident investigations, most of the time we're brought in when there's been a, 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 quite often a major incident and the, the client wants to understand it from a behavioral point of view. Why did the people do what they did? And that's really quite far down the line. So many organizations will say to people, we want you to, if there is an incident, we want you to separate people. And that's really important. And we want you to, to talk to them and get as much information out of them as you can straight away. That can be hard though especially if we don't explain to people and people don't understand why we want them to do that. Because the why is really this. If you have, if you have an emotional connection to those people, you can, you emphasize what they've gone, emphasize, empathize for what they've gone through. Then actually the last thing you want to do is take them away from their support group. You want to probably want to send them home so they feel better. The problem is when we do that, that means that there's far, they're far less likely to remember what happened tomorrow. So then we are massively on a back foot trying to get the information that we need, not only to understand what stopped this incident, but also to, to find out how do we stop the next one? How do we actually get to understand how this is going to repeat? And we're, then we're back into Swiss cheese and, and all those holes lining back up. Because what we're trying to understand is what happened, not just so we know where the balance of responsibility lies, but also so it doesn't happen again. And in order to understand this, I want to look at the human brain. And we're going to use a model of the human brain that it's often referred to as the triune brain. Now, I'm going to use some terms that you don't have to remember. Some of you may have a medical background. I've come across that before. So I'll, use, I'll give you the terms that we're going to refer to them as, and I'll give you the medical terms just in case you want to, to actually understand how it relates to the brain. But don't feel you've got to remember them. You really don't. So what the triune brain does is take a really complex system and our brains are incredibly complex. They are utterly incredible. We can't touch them in terms of storage capacity technologically. We can't touch them in terms of processing power technologically. They are incredible. And we're only just starting to really understand how they work. And there's still huge amounts about our brain that we just don't get. But understanding a little bit about the brain, how the brain works, can lead us into understanding how do we get the best out of these conversations. So let's look at these three layers. The first of these layers is your human brain. So this is what's called your cortex, particularly your prefrontal cortex. You don't have to remember any of this. It's the bit of the brain that sits at the front up here. It's your logical brain. When we're doing an incident investigation, this is the part of the brain that we're trying to tap into, trying to be very logical, get a timeline, understand exactly what went on. And then we have 
what Steve Peters calls the chimp. We're going to look at the chimp and the human. This model comes from Steve Peters' books called the, the Chimp Paradox. It's a really good book. I would highly recommend it. And it's a great way of understanding the brain. Why he gave these, la these labels to these parts of the brain is simply because that's how they behave. And if you look at this, what's called the limbic system, your emotional brain, it, it behaves exactly like a chimp. And the last part we're going to look at is called your lizard, your lizard brain. Um, basal ganglia sometimes includes the cerebellum, different models put it different ways. But basically, this is your, the base of the brain, and this controls all of your basic functions your breathing, your heart rate, all of the really basic stuff. You think about all the stuff a lizard can do. You never had a conversation with a lizard. So it's really basic stuff. And that means that's what this part of the brain does, all the basic stuff. It's quite interesting because it also means that this back, back of the brain back here is a really scary part if you hit it. I One of my neighbors actually unfortunately he passed away he fell down the stairs and died simply because he hit the back of his head because that controls heart rate breathing all of your basic functions you need to survive but let's look at these two let's look at the chimp and the human this is what steve peters called the divided brain what do you mean by that well have you ever had an argument with yourself have you ever said or done something that split seconds later you wish you could take back? That's what he means by the, the divided brain. Because we've got these two parts of our brain that he calls the chimp and the human. And these two parts of the brain could not be more different. We're going to look at these two. And sometimes it's almost as if there's two voices in your head and those voices are doing this. Well, there are, the chimp and the human. And we use this model in lots of different ways. We can use it in terms of understanding well-being, mental health. We can use it in terms of um, behavioral safety. We're going to use it in terms of understanding how do we get the best out of an investigation process. So let's look at these two. Let's look at the chimp. I'm going to stop this so I can see you guys. I'd like to be able to see you. So what I'd like to know, it's a really simple question. How does a chimp behave? What drives a chimp? So if you can put your answers in the chat box, Tony Dean's going to read them out for me. Food. Absolutely. More food. Food and sex. <laughs> so let me just... Eating, let, procreating. Oh, 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 oh. Let me just pick up. <laughs> Give me a chance. <laughs> Let's pick up food. This is this two particular types of food that this part of the brain likes. So that's salt, uh, sorry, sugar and fat. And the third part, to a lesser extent, is salt. If I give you a boiled chicken or boiled broccoli, then th this part of the brain will put you under fMRI where I can watch your brain working. This part of the brain will not light up. If I give you something that's full of sugar or full of fat, this part of the brain will absolutely light up and you'll have an emotional response to it. And this is why we have a, a worldwide multi-billion dollar fast food industry that's based all upon fats and sugars. So you're right, we have an emotional response to food. Sex, absolutely, it's one of our key drives. What else was on the list, Tony? Territory. Territory, I love that. Have you ever noticed that your colleagues, I'm sure you would never do this, um, people become territorial about things that they have no right to become territorial over? So things like car parking spaces, hot desks. <laughs> we still have that territorial part of us. It's still ingrained in us. What else is on there, Tony? Survival. Absolutely. This is very much linked to the that lizard brain as well. There's a real survival instinct in that. That's if you step out into a road, that part of the brain will, will get you to jump 
back onto the side, onto the footpath. I've been spending too much time with Americans. I'm, I'm translating everything to American onto the sidewalk. Because if you, if you had to think about it, when we get into the human, it's very logical. If you had to think about it, you'd be too late, you'd be dead. So you need something that's gonna react really quickly. So this part of the brain is very, very reactive. Okay, what's next? Fun. Fun, fun. yes. Having fun. I like that. Absolutely. This part of the brain is fun. This part of the brain is humor. Think about chimps in the wild. How they bond as a group is they pick fleas out of each other's hair and eat them. It's, that's not a very good thing to do at work. People seem to get upset if you do that. I don't know why. Um, how, how we bond as human beings is through humor. Have you ever worked somewhere where nobody laughs? What's that as a place to work like? <laughs> Humor is important. It, it's how we bond together. Okay, what else is there? Slight smell, vision, feelings. Sorry, smell? Sight, smell, vision, feelings. Okay. Um, particularly, I'll pick one of those out that's actually very connected to this part of the brain, which is smell. And the reason for that is because smell, the, the olfactory line through the brain connects very nicely to your, your chimp. And that's why, have you ever noticed that smells bring back memories? But they're always emotional memories. When you're doing an investigation, often we think, when we're thinking just about facts and not emotions, we miss so many things because we're thinking about facts. Which actually when was the last time if you asked someone if they smelled anything? Because those smells can bring back so many memories. Thank you. What's next? Belonging. Belonging to a community. Absolutely. This is a good and bad thing for us. Belonging means that we, we sense, it's our sense of us, our sense of working together. We look after each other. The whole challenging piece fits into this part of the brain. And the, the, the other side of it, though, is that how many times have you seen people who've had incidents because they were just trying to help out? This part of the brain wants to help out. It wants to help its team out. It wants to help its, its group out, whether that's the organization or just its team or... It wants to help out. And actually one of the big incidents I investigated was um, a release of gas, um, quite a large release of gas. The only reason it wasn't a big explosion, there wasn't an ignition source, luckily. And that was pure luck. Because, and what happened when you looked back at what one of the big things for that was two guys didn't know how to do it, but they were trying to help out. As I say, it's a double-edged sword, that whole piece of belonging. Anything else, Tony? Um, hierarchy and, and someone else, a real smart person, put Maslow's hierarchy. So everything within that hierarchy. The, Absolutely. So a lot of the base needs, Matt, so those of you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, a lot of the base needs come from um, our chimp. And, and this is very hierarchical. This has this sense that we have to understand where we fit in. This is, can be really useful if you're trying to change a culture. If you've got a group of people who are at the same level in that organization, then they'll still have a hierarchy. One of the ways to change culture fast is pick the leader. They don't necessarily have a job title, but you go up to that group and ask them a tough question and see who they look at. As soon as you know who they look at, that change that person's behavior, yeah, you'll then check into changing culture because they'll bring the whole group with them. Cause, why? Because this part of our brain needs hierarchy. And even when we don't have it in terms of job titles, we'll have it even within a group of people. Okay, anything else? Well, the several, uh, the community and protection of the young and vulnerable, and another yeah. one is mischievous. Absolutely. So let's take the protection of young. This is our caring, nurturing side. 
because it's about our group, we care and look after each other. As I said, it, in terms of health and safety, it taps really nicely into that sense of, you know, when, we're, when I'm trying to get people develop a culture of challenging, if you can tap into that sense of we're just looking at, it's not about telling people off, it's not about catching people out, it's about people looking after each other. That's what you're trying to do. And mischievous, yes, horseplay. That's part of that fun side, isn't it? You give people a boring job because their logical brain, which you're gonna look at next, they're human, that starts shutting down. Then what you're left with is this, this emotional brain starts picking up the slack and it's bored. So what do people do? Find ways to entertain themselves. And that, that's a great way to lead to trouble. So, okay. So that's the, that's the chimp. Fantastic. Let's look at the human. The reason that Steve Peters called it the human is because, well, it does everything that us as human beings, as far as we know, we're the only animals that can do this. All of our higher thinking, mathematics and physics and thinking in the abstract. But there's no emotion here. That, that gives you some idea of what this part of the brain is like. There's absolutely no emotion. So what sorts of words would you associate with this part of the brain? I would say logical. Absolutely. I'm waiting for the chat to come through. <laughs> Restraint. Restraint. I like that. Thanks, Michelle. Um, the chimp will chuck up really interesting words, really interesting ideas, and it is mischievous and fun. And what this part of the brain will do, particularly if it sits right in here called your prefrontal cortex, it will, it will hold it back and go, no. When was the last time you were in the office and someone walked through with a tray of hot drinks and this part of the brain just chucked up the idea, go on, just put your foot out, go on. <laughs> you wouldn't do it, but I bet the idea crossed your head. No, of course not. Um, it's that thought, it's that mischievous thought, and this part of the brain is the, the human brain, the logical brain. Yeah, it's the bit that, that actually, it's the restraint, it's the bit that controls it. What else is it like? Um, someone's put negativity. Oh, that's interesting. It can be. I mean, I would actually, I would send to, send to say, when we use this model to look at um, mental health, the chimp, the emotional side, generally is programmed to be negative, kept our ancestors alive. You know, our ancestors out, let's call, let's call our ancestor Ugg. They're out hunting and gathering. There's a rustling in the bush. And the, the ones that thought, oh, that's my friend coming to see me, were eaten. The ones that went, oh, my God, that's somebody going to eat me and run away and thought negatively, survived. And that's one of the theories as to why we end up with so many negative thoughts, because we're designed to think negatively. My friend Dawn put risk assessment. Yes. The chimp does not see risks. It doesn't. It just head down, trying to get the job done the quickest, the easiest way it can. The human will step back, look at it and go, oh, that could go wrong. And actually, risk assessments are one of the best ways you can actually point to work risk assessment, dynamic risk assessments, what they do. Unfortunately, your chimp works five times faster than your human. The part of your emotional part of your brain works five times faster than your logical brain. That's why I ask you, have you ever done something or said something that split seconds later you wish you could take back? Because that part of your brain is working faster. The, the chimp's working faster. The human's playing catch up and therefore has to play catch up and it catches up eventually and goes, why did I say that? <laughs> we all do it. Anything else? This is all yeah, no one's going to go and put that down, but long-term planning and calculating. I've got Absolutely. Here. All of your planning. All of your planning, calculating, all of that comes from this part of the brain. Anything to think about the future. 
Well, logically, this, when the human thinks about the future, logic, um, it uses the only tool it's got, which is logic, and we call that planning. When the chimp tries to do it, it can only use the tools it's got, which is emotion. Yeah, we call that worrying. And then we're into the whole mental health piece. Same process done by two different parts of the brain with completely different outcomes. Planning's good for us, worrying isn't, because it kicks off the fight or flight response, the stress response. Pleasure. Willpower, willpower linked to deferred re reward. Someone's read the book. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this comes from a lovely piece of research where they, they put a child in a room, gave them, put, gave them a sweet, I think it was actually a marshmallow, and said, if you can, I'm just going to leave the room for 15 minutes. If the marshmallow's still there when I get back, you'll get two marshmallows. So that some children ate the marshmallow straight away, chimp. Some children went, I'll wait for the two marshmallows. Thank you very much. When they actually tracked these children long term, what they found was they had, they did better in education, had more higher powering jobs, all of the things that, not necessarily the right things that we define as um, being more successful in life, they had all of those because they're more driven by the human than their chimp. This is, very, this is very positive. If I take away all emotion though, if you take away all emotion, what are you left with? How do you describe that person? Cold, calculating, psychopathic, sociopathic. <laughs> do you see how We've got these really two very interesting parts of our brain. That we've got this emotional brain, which is not good or bad, it's both, because it's every one of our emotions. It is, it is angry, it is envious, but at the same time it's loving, it's caring. We've got our logical brain, which is cold, calculating, but also good at things like planning and um, risk assessments, now do you understand why you have an argument in your head with yourself sometimes? Because both these parts of the brain have their own voice. Now, when you also start to see why we start to use this in things like behavioral safety for the simple reason that if you wanna know why people will put themselves and other people at risk, that's because their limbic system, their chimp just takes over because that part of the brain just takes over. They wanna get the job done to help the team out and they wanna do it in the quickest, the easiest way. If we can get them to stop and actually start thinking about the human and start thinking about the risks, which is where point of work risk assessments, dynamic risk assessments, where they come in, when they're good, when they're not seen as another piece of paper you're filling in the office later on, that's when they're really powerful. Because as soon as you stop and start thinking about risk, you have to use your logical brain. You have to jump from your chimp to your human and start using that part of the brain. And I'm very conscious of time. So I'm gonna just move us on a little bit. Um, and I think it's, I just wanna talk about, so we've talked about the fact that we have these three different parts of our brain. When we do an incident investigation, too often, what we're trying to do is actually think about the, the human brain, the logical brain. And when we sit people down, we're trying to get facts from them. Facts, human brain. Actually, that's not how our brains work. That's not how our memories work particularly under trauma. So there's a form of interviewing that was developed by um, the American military and it's called trauma-informed interview. It's longer term, it's forensic experimental trauma interview or FETI for sure. And FETI is interesting in that rather than starting with the human, rather than starting with the facts and figures, what you do is start at the back of the brain and work forward. So you actually start with 
what's called a grounding question. I said, if you think about a, a lizard, very basic animal, what it does is it's all, all of your basic needs. So things like thirst, temperature, because it's connected to your nervous system, your spinal cord. So bring some, one way to bring someone who is under trauma back to the here and now is asking them a really simple question where they have to come, to come back into contact with their own body. So you start off with what's called a grounding question. Are you thirsty? Would you like a glass of water? Are you cold? Would you like a blanket? These are ways to just bring someone back to here and now. Because someone under trauma, their brain, particularly their chimp, is running off and screaming. If we can actually ask the right, really simple question, we can bring someone here back right here, right now. Then we can go on to feelings. We'll get to the facts later, but we'll go on to feelings. How did it feel? Is there any sounds, taste, smell, touch? Put yourself in somebody else's shoes. What did they see? Imagine that you're over the, the site looking down. What, did, what would you see? Then you can go into facts and figures. Now, this is a really simple way of trying to get out information from people that have gone through a traumatic event. There are other ways in our bigger course, we, we, we go through a whole range of cognitive, what called cognitive interviewing techniques. But all of those are based on this idea and they sit within this gym, this emotional brain. Because if you think about trauma, it is those memories are almost like a collection of jigsaw pieces that have been thrown in the air and got stuck in mid-flight. What's what I said about we we ask we ask particularly the often things like site managers something's gone wrong we ask them to separate the people put them in a room with no support um, and then go and ask them questions and that can feel a horrible thing to do. What is really interesting for me as a psychologist is that what we there's still a lot about the brain that we don't understand. What we're starting to understand in one of the th current theories around PTSD is that. What you have is a collection of fragmented memories. And if you look at PTSD therapy, what they're trying to do is take someone back through those memories and contextualize them, put them into context. Now, okay, put them into context. So, so what? Well, by putting them into context, some amazing things can happen. Your brain can actually start to have them being less jarring. And we also know at sleep, what happens is your brain, we say time heals or wounds, it doesn't, sleep does. And actually, when someone's asleep, your brain actually starts to take some of the emotion away from memories. That's what PTSD therapy does by contextualizing those memories. One of the things I say to people who you know, have come on my um, training courses for, for this sort of thing is that, it can feel a horrible thing to do to separate someone and interview them at the worst time when they need a lot of support and they need to feel like they need to go home. You can actually help their mental health. That's what we're starting to see is that by helping them contextualize those fragmented memories that got through the hippocampus, you can actually help their mental health in the long term. And it could actually help them to be able to contextualize and overcome some of the pain from those emotions and from those memories. And the thing is, we have to, we have to bear in mind really one key thing is that you're never gonna get a perfect timeline. We have to make it okay to people to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. When we ask a question, if we put people under pressure to come up with an answer, they'll come up with an answer and they'll guess. If they guess, their brain then fills that, that gap in because your brain wants to fill the gaps in with that guess and that will become their truth. And that can send us down a 
whole different route of investigating in the wrong direction. It's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to not have a perfect timeline. It's okay to not remember everything simply because that's how our brains work. So I'm very conscious of time. So I've rushed through the last bit, but um, I just wanted to give us some time for some questions. Tony, so, um, it's, it's me. I've got a very quick question before I move on to the others, because um, I know there's several coming through. What about the adrenaline factor? Because when you have something traumatic, adrenaline's pumped through your body, yep. and that affects the hypo, uh, whatever the hypo thingy, Bobsy, mm, as yep. well. Uh, do you have to allow the adrenaline to move away from your body before interviewing them, or anything else like that, etc.? No, because so one of the things we cover in the, the wider course is there's there's a really simple technique called um, mirroring. And you, probably, you may come across it in terms of what salespeople do. So they mirror a person's body language so you can get connection with that person. Have you ever heard of mirroring someone's speech, though? No. Something really interesting happens. If you want to bring someone out of fight or fly, out of stress response, you cannot run a stress response and breathe slowly. So you next see when someone's in a stress response because they speak really quickly. You ever seen someone stand up and do a presentation? They're not, they're not um, very confident presenters and they start speaking really quickly and it actually if you actually match their rate of speech and then over quite a short period of time bring your rate of speech back down they'll match their rate of speech and bring their rate of speech back down you cannot speak slowly and run a stress response you can actually stop their body releasing adrenaline epinephrine and the other two chemicals that are in stress, which is norepinephrine and cortisol, you can actually stop their body releasing that simply by your rate of speech. <laughs> it's funny these little tricks that you can pick up and, and, and just to get bring them back. And again, that's part of that centering piece, bringing them back to the now. That's a good question. Thank you. What are the questions um, you have? Uh, I've got one here from Simon, Simon Rosser. I don't know whether you can unmute yourself, Simon. I don't know whether it's a question or a, a, a statement. Are you there? Uh, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Simon. Right. Whilst we cannot carry out interviews like the police and do under caution, and yep. we need to be aware of trauma, shouldn't we be using things like sort of cognitive interviewing where possible, using four steps, like so report everything? no yep. matter whether they think it's important or not, then look, reinstate the context, change order and then change perspective. So they're looking at it from say, another witness's point of view or what, some, what they think somebody else would have seen if they're the, uh, the injured party or for instance. Yep, exactly. And this is, it, I, I mentioned that this is a snapshot of a bigger course. On, the, on our bigger course, that's exactly what we go through. We go through the different range of mnemonics um, so con a different range of cognitive interviewing techniques and how to use them, give people examples and, and opportunities to do that. And we do that in a really simple way. But when the people come onto the course, we give them three things to remember. So the last concert that they went to, the last wedding that they went to, and the, a, a party they went to as a child. Uh, uh, and um, so long term memory, basically. And then we, at the end of the course, we get them to go back through those three and actually using mnemonics. And we add one, which is work something backwards. I know recipe is good for that. And actually it's amazing. Those three things that they do at the beginning of the course through what's called free recall, they then go back and use the mnemonics of, um, and kind of interviewing. And actually the list that they get out of that is usually at least double the list of free recall. So I agree, Simon, it's, and it is a, it's a great technique and it works really incredibly well. And a lot of that is because it connects to that chimp, that emotional brain, it, and it's helping people to, to, to be able to contextualise emotional memories. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. How reliable, without this interview technique, would... Sorry, I've got... Uh, Richard, you've got your hands up, sorry. No, no, I put it up just as you were, you, you asked your question. <laughs> Go on. All right, okay. I was going to ask about, uh, Tony, about, so setting up the room. So you talked about making a connection. So obviously 
if you do what the police do, which is sit across a table and you can't see <laughs> the body and you can't, you're not really making a connection. So that that's that's probably a no, I guess. No, no, it's, it's, it's funny because Simon just said something about what we cover in the wider course and you just asked a question, well, we cover this in the wider course. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, well, I, I guess I guess if you, if you want to really make... Simple, in really if simple you, terms, so yeah. if this is your table, yeah, and C, A is here, B is here, um, C is here, and D is here, you can ask people, where's the best place to sit? If the person sat here in B, so this is your, this is the person you're questioning, they're sat here in B, where's the best place to sit? And the honest I, answer is, it depends, because there's pros and cons to all of them. So if you're sat in A, if you need, if you want to be on, literally on someone's side and talking about that out there, you can sit in A. And that, actually can make people feel that you're very much on their side, you're next to them. The downside of that is you can't see their body language. It's really hard to pick up any, on any, um, any cues that are coming from body language. And we talk about some of the myths around that. There's a lot of myths around that. Um, so A can be useful if someone's very upset and you wanna literally physically be on their side. Um, C is useful in most cases where you've got something to lean on, but you're showing them what you're recording. Um, D, which is what the police use, can be useful if you think someone's going to be aggressive and the door is here. <laughs> Let's be honest. Oh dear. Because know. let's be honest about this. It, it sometimes, if you're not sure how someone's going to respond, even if you're taking a second person in with you, having that as a barrier between they've got to get over that before you get out the door. It's worth thinking about. So the, it, when you look at this sort of stuff, there's no right answer. I would love to say, yes, you would always sit in C. It's always C. The answer is always C. It's not, it really isn't because it's, because it's human beings and there's no right answer to when it comes to human beings. Okay. It's about, thinking about it through as you before you go in the room and how the person's reacting. And sometimes, actually, if you want to be really tricky, start in D and go to C or A. Because you can actually, therefore, you can generate empathy by coming round onto their side. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Cheers. No problem. Thanks. What other questions do we yeah. have? Tony, what, I, 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 there's nothing in the chat, but one last question is that have you ever been used as an expert witness about someone's testimony, you know, by the defence to say that, because if we get this wrong, as you said, you could be moving into a territory where people are making up things just to satisfy, uh, to satisfy you, etc. you know, so, yeah. yeah. I, I, I never, personally, I've never done that, um, I'll be honest. I've never done that as an expert witness. Um, the thing is, what we, call, what we talk about in the wider course is the fact that, to be honest, the biggest myth around body language is that it, most of it's a myth. Yeah. Um, if, you look at, if you look at people who are, um, can say, oh, lie detecting, lie detecting through body language, the research shows you're 51%, um, most people are around 51% um, able to pick up when someone is lying through body language. The problem is that's only just over tossing a coin. Mm -hmm. And what they found was that teaching people to read body language actually reduced that. So you become less accurate than if you just tossed a coin. Yeah. So there's a lot of myths around body language. And actually, so in terms of the, a lot of what we're looking at is not so much the legal stuff. It's just trying to understand what happened. Why did they do what they did? And so I've been asked to come along and look at incidents, not really from a, a legal perspective, but more really from a behavioural perspective in terms of how do we how do we design this out? One of the areas I've worked a lot in is in error does, um, error reduction, error eradication, whatever you want to call it, but where you're actually trying to design out the ability for people to get things wrong. There's a Japanese system for this called Pokey Oak. Um, 
And a lot of what the work I've done in that was with an IT company who shut down a major airport for a while. And they wanted to come in and look at this and say, so it wasn't a health and safety incident. It was actually more of a, it was in fact that we just pulled the wrong cable. Why did, pe why did people get to a point where they're able to pull the wrong cable? And that's the bit that you start to then look into. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, before I hand over to Michelle, just someone was asking about details about your course and uh, what I'll do is, am I right to fold uh, details onto people if they want to speak to you, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I can send you a fact sheet. Absolutely. Yeah. Send me one if you will, Tony, please. Yes, I'll do that. Where, Michelle, you there? Yeah. Oh, thanks, Tony. It was really good. I think we could I could have spent longer. I actually think that when we get going again with the branch meetings, I think it would be more effective in a room, wouldn't it? You know, yeah. You know, like to do like a bite size for your training, if you like. I think a lot of the questions I could see in the chat was, you know, people wanted to know a bit more, and I've certainly made a few notes at, notes anyway. But yeah, if you if you're up for maybe you know, one of our, you know, next face-to-face -face ones, I think it'd be a, I feel like we've got more to discuss. So if, if people are, you know, we've got quite a few people still on the call. Um, more than happy so to. yeah, but thank you for your time and appreciate, you know, time's precious to people and really appreciate you giving us the time this afternoon. And if you've got, um, are you on LinkedIn as well, Tony? I am under Tony Roscoe. I can I can put the link in the chat. Can you put the link know. in the chat. Anyone who's on, because I know that there's a couple of people there who's put um, a couple of people there who've who've asked for details of the course. So if you if you paste it into the chat, then I can do that. I'll do that now. He says putting in the sign in the room. Sorry, <laughs> that's me. Yeah. Thanks so much. Anyway, anything else, Tony Dean? We got anything else to do are we going to just wrap up for networking then yes and thanks sony i'll be in touch oh, you're, you're welcome do you want me to stay on for the networking you can do in case uh, there's some happy questions to. for you yeah i'm on happy to thank you thanks thank you so